Galilee's cerulean waters, <coughs> through Jerusalem, warm <laughs> and narrow streets. Wherever Jesus went, he bore living evidence that God had condescended to walk among men, to share the best of heaven with the worst of earth. <coughs> we know the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Bible says, that though he was rich, yet for your sake he became poor, that ye, through his poverty, might be rich. Ah, but let me repeat the question. How would Jesus react to our kind of world? To our egotistical piety, our complacent materialism, our modern system of double standards, our smugness. Do we not need once again to stand with Peter at the water's edge and hear the master say, follow me and I will make you to become fishers of men. Only then can we understand what this same apostle meant when his heart inflamed by the very dynamic presence of Pentecost, he wrote, to that you were called because Christ suffered on your behalf and thereby left you an example. It is for you to follow in his steps. Is not this what a frightened world needs to discover? Intolerance, injustice, blatant disregard for the needs of others. What would Jesus do? What would be his decision, his reaction, his sense of responsibility? And do we not need to once again examine from the scriptures what were his reactions to the blind man, the beggar, the leper, yes, the proud Pharisee, the pagan governor, the hungry-hearted and the self-satisfied, the proud and the contrite. If we claim to bear the name of Christ, then we cannot escape the haunting implications of our text. For that ye were called, because Christ suffered on your behalf and thereby left you an example. And it is for you to follow in his steps. Let us stand for prayer. Excuse me, Reverend, if you don't mind. <coughs> I don't mean to speak out of line, Reverend. And I'm not drunk. I'm not a drinking man. It's all right, gentlemen. So long as our friend remains orderly, let's hear what he has to say. You may all be seated. Thank you, Reverend. Thank you. Well, what I want to say is, I... <coughs> this is outrageous. Why don't they call the police? I wouldn't feel it to be quite right, if you understand what I mean, Reverend. Coming up to the front there, like where you are. I've had my share of tough luck. Right now, it's my health. But I ain't here for sympathy or charity, nothing like that. This is outrageous. Your sermon this morning, Reverend what I heard of it. Well, take what happened to my wife. <coughs> she died last winter. Pneumonia. We had three children. They've been taken away from me now by the welfare. It was during that cold snap we had last January. You remember, real cold. We had an apartment, a flat on the east side. Owned by a party from this church, I'm led to understand. Which was why I happened to come here this morning. Mostly curious, you might say. And not intending to speak up this way. It was your sermon that put it in my mind to say something, Reverend. I was just sitting here wondering, <coughs> listening to your sermon. I, I couldn't help but ask myself, 
Why doesn't someone call the police? <laughs> if people followed Jesus, like you said there in your sermon, I was wondering if, if my wife, <coughs> if she... <coughs> Pardon me, Reverend. <coughs> He's not ill. He's just trying to get sympathy. Uh, lay him on the bench. Shall we call the county hospital, Pastor? Loosen his clothes. Uh, call our doctor, dear. circulation and advertising there, Clark. Tell him yet, we're fat as a goose. Ah, it looks great. Clark, you're amazing. <laughs> Say, wait till you hear the latest. Central States beer. Just about ready to sign for six weeks. Full page second color on Sunday. <laughs> hey, speaking of Sunday, that must have been quite a story that broke in your church yesterday morning. How are you handling it? Yesterday morning? You play nine or eighteen holes. What happened? Don't look at me. I always have a few extra drinks I have to sleep off on Sunday morning. <laughs> oh, just some scuttlebutt I heard around town. Probably isn't a story. I'll tell you one thing, boys. People like the way we've been needling City Hall. There ain't nothing like politics to sell newspapers and advertising. Would you like me to run down that church story, Ed? Just a minute, Jim. Let me check something. Morning, Pastor Maxwell speaking. Uh, yes, Pastor. Uh, this is Ed Norman down at the newspaper office. I uh, didn't make it to church yesterday morning. Was there uh, something unusual? Hmm, how about that? Uh, I just came from the hospital, Ed. Uh, the man's coherent, but... Uh, so confused. Shall we uh, run a story in the paper? Well, not yet, Ed, please. Uh, or oh, what happened would make a good story, I suppose, but... I understand, Pastor. We'll forget it. Well, there may be a story. A great story, God helping us. How's that? Do your best to be at worship Sunday morning, Ed. I'm going to use the same text I preached on yesterday. Same text, but... God helping me by a different preacher. Goodbye, Pastor. No story? Well, anything more you'd like me to do in that summer stock pit we did for the Civic? And so what shall I ask of life? Or do I have the right to ask? The moving finger rises. And having writ, moves on. Nor all your piety, nor wit, shall lure it back to cancel half a line. Nor all your tears wash out a word of it. And that inverted bowl we call the sky, where under crawling cooped we live and die, look not to it for help, for it as impotently rolls as you or I. Wonderful, wonderful, darling. You surprised me. <laughs> Working on your line for the audition, dear. I'm not sure what I'll use. Maybe this little bit from the play we did last winter. You know, where I was that mixed up college girl. If only your father could have lived to see this day. Our own darling Rachel, about to become the oh, most... Oh, come now, Mother. It's only summer stock. Only summer stock, you sweet girl. Greg Renoir, Broadway's finest young producer-director, here to handle the whole summer theater season, and you say, only summer stock. What did that nice story in the newspaper say this spring? 
Rachel Page, the finest talent our town has ever produced. Only some are stuck. Wait until Mr. Lenoir hears you audition. When are the auditions? Tuesday and Wednesday? Wednesday and Thursday nights. Oh, that's better yet. I thought we'd take a drive out into the country this weekend. It would be so relaxing for you. But I... What's the matter? I can't get out of my mind what happened in church yesterday. Well, we're certainly not going to be seen in church next Sunday. That derelict and what he said. Living in one of our apartments. I think I'd like to be in church next Sunday. But, Rachel... So, it was as I told you. I watched him die. That strange visitor who disturbed our complacency last Sunday morning. A man to whom life had brought so much disillusionment, so much disappointment that that somehow he couldn't believe, at least not so I could detect the faintest glimmer of faith, he could not believe that Jesus Christ, the Son of God, could, even in the last moments of his life, give eternal meaning to his existence. Why? Could it perhaps be because so few of us, so very few, have ever really been touched by the transforming gospel ourselves? The gospel is the power of God, the greatest power in the world, but lost men must first see that power demonstrated in the lives of God's children, your neighbors, the people where you work. What evidence of this power do they see in your life? Ah, never mistake it. The church is not this building or any other building. It's people. God's people, representing him in the office, the shop, around the neighborhood. Listen again to the words of the text. For Christ suffered on your behalf and left you an example that you should follow in his steps. He never sinned, nor was anything deceitful ever heard from his lips. He was abused, but he did not answer with abuse. He himself carried our sins in his own body to the cross so that we might die to our sins and live for righteousness. Live for righteousness in his steps, completely dependent by faith upon the power of the Holy Spirit. The power of the Holy Spirit revealing God to a lost world through men and women sick of themselves their own self-sufficiency, their contrived piety. Men and women who are candidates for life's greatest reality, the reality of Jesus Christ. I feel strangely constrained to propose an experiment, which God helping us could become a demonstration. Proof, first of all to ourselves, than to a skeptical world around us that, that God intends biblical Christianity to be a contemporary experience. Don't be alarmed. Some of the older members of this congregation can recall a day when there was nothing shocking about an altar call, but that day has passed. We've become a proper congregation. We've established a precise behavior which succeeds quite well in relegating God to a religious island visited between the hours of 11 and 12 on Sunday morning. So I'm asking those of you who want to join me in this experiment in discipleship to meet in the lower auditorium on Wednesday evening. Now this will give you several days to think, to quiet any emotions which may have been aroused from what I have said this morning. And thus to know your thoughts your motives, the real desires of your heart. Now, we shall be dismissed this morning without a benediction, with neither singing nor the organ postlude, and if you will, without any conversation of any kind, 
as we leave the sanctuary. You're dismissed. Wait till you see what I got at the Vogue shop. This is for you to wear to the auditions tonight. Or this if you prefer. Open it, darling. Aren't you excited? The necklace would go well with a number of things you'd be wearing on stage. What's wrong? Mother, I... I took a drive this afternoon. Out to the east side. You have no business in that part of town. You... Besides, darling, you shouldn't worry your pretty little head about anything except concentrating on that wonderful art of yours. Are you all ready for the auditions tonight? I'm not going to the auditions. Not going to the auditions? Why, I'm going to church. The meeting Pastor Maxwell announced following his sermon Sunday morning. Are you out of your mind, child? The chance of your whole life to audition before Gregory Lenoir. The auditions are tonight and tomorrow night. Then you will go to the audition tomorrow night? As far as I know now. Well, if... if you're sure that... God bless you, each one of you, for this initial evidence of your interest in true discipleship. The church today knows very little of this. We have religion, church membership, abundant activity, but discipleship, living identification with a risen, triumphant Christ, I shall not encumber you with theological definitions, for my only concern is to turn your gaze inward to the hungering need of your own heart, and then to God helping me to join you in a search, a search for the meaning through a living demonstration in our lives of real discipleship. That may not be an easy road. We'll speak more of this later. But neither is the road of rebellion easy, that way of life which demands so much pretense, which keeps us from discovering who we really are, why God created us. But for now, let's talk about discipleship. How do I, a seeking Christian, discover God's intention for my life? Well, first of all, I must be clean. Not only clean from the sin of unbelief through regeneration, but clean through the recreating power of the Holy Spirit. Clean in all my motives. Clean in all my attitudes toward others. My actions as well as my reactions cleansed from such dastardly religious sins as self-piety, the holier-than-thou attitude, the expected response to all spiritual stimuli. Then, as a disciple of Jesus Christ, I must be obedient. I must see the Bible as God's contract, with God himself as the party of the first part, with me as the party of the second part. And I must recognize that God will always abide by the terms of his contract. 
and that I too, in complete obedience, must likewise abide by those terms of the contract which apply to me. And then there's a third step of discipleship which I must take. Under the guidance of the Holy Spirit, I must take the divine initiative. 